beginning Proem of Australia Felix, Book One of the Fortunes of Richard Marnie. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tabithat. Australia Felix by Henry Handel Richardson. Proem. In a shaft on the gravel pits, a man had been buried alive. At work in a deep, wet hole, he had recklessly omitted to slab the walls of a drive. Uprights and tailors yielded under the lateral pressure, and the rotten earth collapsed, bringing down the roof in its train. The digger fell forward on his face, his ribs jammed across his pick, his arms pinned to his sides, nose and mouth pressed into the sticky mud as into a mask. And over his defenceless body, with a roar that burst his eardrums, broke stupendous masses of earth. His mates at the windlass went staggering back from the belch of violently discharged air. It tore the windsail to strips, sent stones and gravel flying, loosened planks and props. Their shouts drawing no response, the younger and nimbler of the two—he was a mere boy for all his amazing growth of beard—put his foot in the bucket and went down on the rope, kicking off the sides of the shaft with his free foot. A group of diggers, gathering around the pit-head, waited for the tug at the rope. It was quick in coming, and the lad was hauled to the surface. No hope. Both drives had fallen in. The bottom of the shaft was blocked. The crowd melted with a, "'Poor Bill! God rest his soul!' or with a silent shrug. Such accidents were not infrequent. Each man might thank his stars it was not he who lay cooling down below. And so, since no more wash-dirt would be raised from this hole— the party that worked it made off for the nearest grog-shop to wet their throats to the memory of the dead, and to discuss future plans. All but one, a lean and haggard-looking man of some five-and-forty, who was known to his comrades as Long Jim. On hearing his mate's report, he had sunk heavily down on a log, and there he sat, a pannikin of raw spirit in his hand, the tears coursing ruts down cheeks scabby with yellow mud his eyes glassy as marbles with those that had still to fall. He wept, not for the dead man, but for himself. This accident was the last link in a chain of ill-luck that had been forging ever since he first followed the diggings. He only needed to put his hand to a thing, and luck deserted it. In all the sinkings he had been connected with, he had not once caught his pick in a nugget, or got the run of a gutter. The bottoms had always proved barren drives been exhausted without his raising the colour. At the present claim he and his mates had toiled for months, overcoming one difficulty after another. The slabbing, for instance, had cost them infinite trouble. It was roughly done, too, and even after the pins were in, great flakes of earth would come tumbling down from between the joints, on one occasion nearly knocking silly the man who was below. Then, before they had slabbed a depth of three times nine, they had got into water, and in this they had worked for the next sixty feet. They were barely rid of it when the two adjoining claims were abandoned, and in came the flood again. This time they had to fly for their lives before it, so rapid was its rise. Not the strongest man could stand in this ice-cold water for more than three days on end. The bark slabs stank in it, too, like the skins in a tanner's yard, and they had been forced to quit work till it subsided. He and another man had gone to the hills to hew trees for more slabs, the rest to the grog-shop. From there, when it was feasible to make a fresh start, they had to be dragged, some blind drunk, the rest blind stupid from their booze. That had been the hardest job of any, keeping the party together. They had only been eight in all, a hand-to-mouth number for a deep wet hole. Then one had died of dysentery, contracted from working constantly in water up to his middle. Another had been nabbed in a manhunt and clapped into the logs. And finally, but a day or two back, the three men who completed the night shift had deserted for a new rush to the evoker. Now his pal had gone too. There was nothing left for him, Long Jim, to do but to take his dish and turn Fossica, or even to aim no higher than washing over the tailings rejected by the Fossica. At the thought his tears flowed anew. He cursed the day on which he had first set foot on Ballarat. "'It's hell for white men. Hell, that's what it is. Here, have another drink, matey, and forget your bloody troubles.' 
His refilled pannikin drained, he grew warmer around the heart, and sang the praises of his former life. He had been a lamplighter in the old country, and for many years had known no more arduous task than that of tramping around certain streets three times daily, ladder on shoulder, bitch at heel, to attend the little flames that helped to dispel the London dark. And he might have jogged on at this up to threescore years and ten, had he never lent an ear to the tales that were being told of a wonderful country, where for the mere act of stooping, and with your naked hand, you could pick up a fortune from the ground. Might the rogues who had spread these lies be damned to all eternity? Then he had swallowed them only too willingly, and leaving the old woman wringing her hands, had taken every farthing of his savings and set sail for Australia. That was close on three years ago. For all he knew, his wife might be dead and buried by this time, or sitting in the almshouse. She could not write, and only in the early days had an occasional newspaper reached him on which, alongside the Queen's head, she had put the mark they had agreed on to show that she was still alive. He would probably never see her again, but would end his days where he was. Well, they wouldn't be many. This was not a place that made old bones. And as he sat worked on by grief and liquor, he was seized by a desperate homesickness for the old country. Why had he ever been fool enough to leave it? He shut his eyes, and all the well-known sights and sounds of the familiar streets came back to him. He saw himself on his rounds of a winter afternoon, when each lamp had a halo in the foggy air, heard the pit-pat of his forefooter behind him, the bump of the ladder against the prong of the lamp-post. His friend the policeman's glazed stove-pipe shone out at the corner. From the distance came the tinkle of the muffin-man's bell, the cries of the buyer-brooms. He remembered the glowing charcoal in the stoves of the chestnut and potato-sellers, the appetizing smell of the cooked fish-shops, the fragrant steam of the hot, dark coffee at the tuppenny stall when he had turned shivering out of bed. He sighed for the lights and jollity of the hare and hounds on a Saturday night. He would never see anything of the kind again. No, here, under bare blue skies, out of which the sun frizzled you alive. Here, where it couldn't rain without at once being a flood, where the very winds blew contrarily, hot from the north and bitter chill from the south, where no matter how great the heat by day, the night would as likely as not be nipping cold. Here he was doomed to end his life, and to end it for all the yellow sunshine, more hopelessly knotted and gnarled with rheumatism, than if dawn after dawn he had gone out in a cutting north-easter, or groped his way through the grey fog-mists sent up by the grey Thames. Thus he sat and brooded, all the hatred of the unwilling exile for the land that gives him house-room burning in his breast. Who the man was, who now lay deep in a grave that fitted him as a glove fits the hand, careless of the past to which he had brought his mate, who this really was, Long Jim knew no more than the rest. Young Bill had never spoken out. They had chummed together on the seventy-odd mile tramp from Melbourne, had boiled a common billy, and slept side by side in rain-soaked blankets under the scanty hair of a she-oak. This was in the days of the first great stampede to the gold-fields, when the embryo seaports were as empty as though they were plague-ridden, and every man who had the use of his legs was on the wide bush track bound for the north. It was better to be two than one in this medley of bullock-teams, lorries, carts, and pack-horses, of dog-teams, wheelbarrows, and swagmen, where the air rang with oaths, shouts, and hammering hooves, with whip-cracking and bullock-prodding, in this hurly-burly of thieves, bush-rangers, and foreigners, of drunken convicts and deserting sailors, of slit-eyed Chinese and apt-handed lascars, of expirees and ticket-of-leave men, of Jews, Turks, and other infidels. Long Jim, himself stunned by it all, by the pother of landing and of finding a roof to cover him, by the ruinous price of bare necessaries, by the length of this unheard-of walk that lay before his town-bred feet, Long Jim had gladly accepted the young man's company on the road. Originally, for no more than this, at heart he distrusted young Bill because of his fine gentleman airs, and intended shaking the lad off as soon as they reached the diggings. There a man must, for safety's sake, be alone when he stooped to pick up his fortune. But at first sight of the strange wild scene that met his eyes, he hastily changed his mind. 
and so the two of them had stuck together, and he had never had cause to regret it. For all his lily-white hands and finical speech, young Bill had worked like a nigger, standing by his mate through the latter's disasters, had worked until the ladyish hands were horny with warts and corns, and this, though he was doubled up with dysentery in the hot season, and racked by winter cramps. But the life had proved too hard for him all the same. During the previous summer he had begun to drink, steadily, with the dogged persistence that was in him, and since then his work had gone downhill. His sudden death had only been a hastening on of the inevitable. Staggering home to the tent after nightfall, he would have been sure, sooner or later, to fall into a dry shicer and break his neck, or into a wet one and be drowned. On the surface of the gravel pit his fate was already forgotten. The rude activity of a gold-diggings in full swing had closed over the incident, swallowed it up. Under a sky so pure and luminous that it seemed like a thinly drawn veil of blueness which ought to have been transparent, stretched what, from a short way off, resembled a desert of pale clay. No patch of green offered rest to the eye. Not a tree, hardly a stunted bush, had been left standing, either on the bottom of the vast shallow basin itself, or on the several hillocks that dotted it and formed its sides. Even the most prominent of these, the Black Hill, which jutted out on the flat like a gigantic tumulus, had been stripped of its dense timber, feverishly disembowelled, and was now become a bald protuberance strewn with gravel and clay. The whole scene had that strange, repellent ugliness that goes with breaking up and throwing into disorder what has been sanctified as final, and belongs in particular to the wanton disturbing of earth's gracious green-spread crust. In the pre-golden era this wide valley, lying open to sun and wind, had been a lovely grassland, ringed by a circlet of wooded hills, beyond these by a belt of virgin forest. A limpid river, and more than one creek, had meandered across its face. Water was to be found there even in the driest summer. She-oaks and peppermint had given shade to the flocks of the early settlers. Bottles had bloomed their brief delirious yellow passion against the grey-green foliage of the gums. Now all that was left of the original pleasant resting-place in its pristine beauty were the ancient volcanic cones of Warrenhype and Buninyong. These, too far off to supply wood for firing and slabbing, still stood green and timbered, and looked down upon the havoc that had been made of the fair pastoral lands. Seen nearer at hand, the dun-coloured desert resolved itself into uncountable pimpling clay and mud-heaps, of diverse shade and varying sizes. Some consisted of but a few bucketfuls of mullock, others were taller than the tallest man. There were also hundreds of rain-soaked, mud-bespattered tents, sheds and awnings, wind-sails which fell, funnel-like, from a kind of gallows into the shafts they ventilated, flags fluttering on high posts in front of stores. The many human figures that went to and fro were hardly to be distinguished from the ground they trod. They were coated with earth, clay clad in ochre and gamboge. Their faces were daubed with clauber. It matted great beards and entangled the coarse hairs on chests and brawny arms. Where here and there a blue jumper had kept a tinge of blueness, it was so besmeared with yellow that it might have been expected to turn green. The gauze neck veils that hung from the brims of wide-awakes or cabbage trees were become stiff little lattices of caked clay. There was water everywhere. From the spurs and gullies round about the autumn rains had poured freely down on the flat, River and creeks had been over their banks, and such narrow ground spaces remained between the thick sown tents, the myriads of holes that abutted one on another, jealous of every inch of space, had become a trough of mud. Water meandered over this mud, or carved its soft way in channels. It lay about in puddles, thick and dark as coffee grounds. It filled abandoned shallow holes to the brim. From this scene rose a blurred hum of sound rose, and as it were, remained stationary above it, like a smoke-cloud, which no wind comes to drive away. Gradually, though, the ear made out, in the conglomerate of noise, a host of separate noises infinitely multiplied. The sharp tick-tick of surface-picks, the dull thud of shovels, their muffled echoes from the depths below. There was also the continuous squeak and groan of windlasses, 
the bump of the mullock emptied from the bucket, the trundle of wheelbarrows pushed along a plank from the shaft's mouth to the nearest pool, the dump of the dart on the heap for washing. Along the banks of a creek hundreds of cradles rattled and grated, the noise of the spades chopping the gravel into the puddling tubs or the long toms was like the scrunch of shingle under waves. The fierce yelping of the dogs chained to the flagposts of stores, mongrels which yapped at friend and foe alike, supplied a note of ear-splitting discord. But except for this it was a wholly mechanical din. Human brains directed operations, human hands carried them out, but the sound of the human voice was, for the most part, lacking. The diggers were a sombre, preoccupied race, little given to lip-work. Even the shepherds, who, in waiting to see if their neighbours struck the lead, beguiled the time with euchre and lambskinnet, played moodily, their mouths glued to their pipe-stems. They were tail on end to fling down the cards for pick and shovel. The great majority, ant-like in their indefatigable busyness, neither turned a head nor looked up. Backs were bent, eyes fixed in a hard scrutiny of cradle or tin dish. It was the earth that held them, the familiar homely earth, whose common fate it is to be trodden heedlessly underfoot. Here it was the lodestone that drew all men's thoughts, and it took toll of their bodies in odd exhausting forms of labour which were swift to weed out the unfit. The men at the windlasses spat into their horny palms and bent to the crank. They paused only to pass the back of a hand over a sweaty forehead, or to drain a nose between two fingers. The barrow-drivers shoved their loads, the bones of their forearms standing out like ribs. Beside the pools the puddlers chopped with their shovels, some even stood in the tubs and worked the earth with their feet as wine-pressers trample grapes. The cradlers, eternally rocking with one hand, held a long stick in the other with which to break up any clods a careless puddler might have deposited in the hopper. Behind these came the great army of fossickers, washers of surface dirt, quipped with knives and tin dishes, and content if they could wash out half a pennyweight to the dish. At their heels still others, who treated the tailings they threw away. And among these last was a sprinkling of women, more than one with an infant suckling at her breast. Withdrawn into a group for themselves worked a body of Chinese, in loose blue blouses, flappy blue leg-bags, and huge conical straw hats. They too fossicked and re-washed, using extravagant quantities of water. Thus the pale-eyed multitude worried the surface, and at the risk and cost of their lives probed the depths. Now that deep sinking was in vogue, gold-digging no longer served as a play-game for the gentlemen in the amateur. The greater number of those who toiled at it were work-tried, seasoned men. And yet, although it had now sunk to the level of any other arduous and uncertain occupation, and the magic prizes of the early days were seldom found, something of the old romantic glamour still clung to this most famous gold-field, dazzling the eyes and confounding the judgment. Elsewhere, the horse was in use at the puddling trough, and machines for crushing quartz were under discussion. But the Ballarat digger resisted the introduction of machinery, fearing the capitalist machinery would bring in its train. He remained the dreamer, the jealous individualist. He hovered for ever on the brink of a stupendous discovery. This dream it was, of vast wealth got without exertion, which had decoyed the strange motley crowd, in which peers and churchmen rubbed shoulders with the scum of Norfolk Island, to exile in this outlandish region. And the intention of all alike had been to snatch a golden fortune from the earth, and then, hey presto, for the old world again. But they were reckoning without their host. Only too many of those who entered the country went out no more. They became prisoners to the soil. The fabulous riches of which they had heard tell amounted at best to a few thousands of pounds. What folly to depart with so little when Mother Earth still teemed! Those who drew blanks nursed an unquenchable hope, and laboured all their days like navvies for a navvy's wage. Others again, broken in health or disheartened, could only turn to an easier handiwork. There were also men who, as soon as fortune smiled on them, dropped their tools and ran to squander the work of months in a wild debauch, and they invariably returned, tail down, to prove their luck anew. 
and yet again there were those who, having once seen the metal in the raw, in dust fine as that brushed from a butterfly's wing, in heavy chubby nuggets, or more exquisite still, as the daffodil yellow veining of bluish white quartz. These were gripped in the subtlest way of all. A passion for the gold itself awoke in them an almost sensual craving to touch and possess, and the glitter of a few specks at the bottom of pan or cradle came in time to mean more to them than home or wife or child. Such were the fates of those who succumbed to the unholy hunger. It was like a form of revenge taken on them, for their loveless schemes of robbing and fleeing, a revenge contrived by the ancient barbaric country they had so lightly invaded. Now she held them captive, without chains, ensorcelled without witchcraft, and lying stretched like some primeval monster in the sun, her breasts freely bared, she watched with malignant eye the efforts made by these puny mortals to tear their lips away. End of Proem <laughs>